All right, so we're just doing an interview just because we can. We brought the good camera, so okay. it's really hard to mess it up. But mm -hmm. um, uh, tell me, uh, this uh, just everyone knows this is my grandma. This is Grandma Richards, and uh, you know we we've been coming over to Grandma's house. We're in uh, we're Cedarville, Utah, right now. Cedar Hills. Cedar Hills, Utah. But um, you know we've been coming over to Grandma's house since I was I was a boy. Um, tell us a little bit about since you were born. Since I was born, I babysat you a lot. Did you really? <laughs> oh yes. Now what was I like as a <clears throat> as a small child? I wrote down three mm -hmm. things, but what I'm going to do for Christmas is right now I am going through our family history. Mm -hmm. And getting it all corrected. Do you still have that big? Of oh, course yeah. we have. Okay. It. Yeah. I'm making a new improved model. Nice. Great. Everybody's going to get one for Christmas. Wonderful. And uh, you'll read stories in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That'll be fun to see. Now. But um, I remember thinking that um, I don't know if you remember uh, Pigpen from. Uh, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Owen was Pigpen. <laughs> he was always dirty, mm -hmm. no matter what. He was always. So dirty. now we know where Benny gets it from. Oh, my kids are <laughs> filthy all the time. Yeah. You know, and this part of me is kind of like cool. They're they're boys. They're out there doing things. But yeah. the other part of me is great. Great. Now we got to buy another shirt. You know. <laughs> right. You know. <clears throat> um, tell us a little bit. Of, can you talk a little bit about our family history and and where are you know who is in our family? Because I talk about it a lot with. Uh, a lot of my LDS friends and, and even some of my uh, born again friends, you know, I'm letting uh, them know sort of, we have sort of, sort of a neat family history. Sure. Well, um, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> uh, as far back as you want to go. <clears throat> and we don't tell the whole story, but you know, just the, the snapshot of, of where our family comes from. Well, on, on uh, my mother's side, they're uh, Irish. Irish. from Ireland. They were Mormon converts from Ireland. On my father's side, they were Mormon converts. And they were both, uh, no, um, on, the, on my father's side, they were very, very poor coal miners mm -hmm. in Scotland. And uh, came over here. Um, so they were Mormon before they were American? Yes. Yes. They saved and scrimped and everything, and I guess <clears throat> Great grandma uh, Nibley was. Um, she could take care of money. I mean, she sold pins and thread and things like that in Scotland to save money. And of course, he was a coal miner, didn't make anything. Hmm. Uh, in Scotland at that time, the children were six to eight years old when they started working in the mines. Wow. Okay. But they came over and went to Utah. And the first. Uh, first winter they were there, they lived in a dugout, what they called a dugout, up in Wellsville, hmm. next to, very close to Logan. Mm -hmm. They, you'd have a little hill rise, and you'd dig out several feet down in the dirt, and then you'd cover it over with some wood and grass, and that would be your dugout. They had something like a 10 by 10, mm. 12 by 12, with six children. Mm. Wow. They didn't have a door, so they just hang a blanket. And they spent two winters there. <laughs> and that was your grandmother and her family? Grandfather. Grandfather. Great okay. grandfather. Well, grandfather was 11 years old when they came across the plains. Okay. He thought it was a great adventure, but it was hard on the adults. <laughs> what, uh, what year was that, approximately? <sighs> Well, let's see. I think he was. Oh, I can't tell you. It's in the history. Is it? Is was it early, like after uh, like early 1900s, or is this? Oh, it's before the 1800s. Before the 1800s. Oh yeah. See, I didn't know that. It I thought we 18, came here. No, 18. It would be because um, they stopped. They stopped bringing wagons over in 1869 because that's when the railroad, mm -hmm. transcontinental railroad, right. came through. Great. And so they were still in wagons and things coming over. So it would be before that. So but somewhere between 1832 and... Well, yeah, it would be more like uh, 1840, something Yeah, like. interesting. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a fast time because Joseph Smith established the church in 1832, correct? 30. 1830. So then word has to spread to Scotland 
Oh yeah, they sent missionaries over there the first year. Sent missionaries the first year, yeah. and then and then found. And that happened in that happened on on uh, Grandpa Lynn's side. <laughs> oh really? Oh yeah, he came from Wales. His hmm. great his grandfather came right from Wales. Gotcha. But they had joined the church over there. Hmm. So we're Welsh and Scotch and Irish. <laughs> and you had actually had our colors done, uh, family well, that's colors. The, that's the tartan. Yeah. And it's registered with the Scottish Tartan Society. That's right. And we have uh, the blanket that you crocheted for us in our house, yes. and it's it's a coveted blanket. We use it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's not just that's a decoration. Cool. Yeah. Hopefully, it wasn't supposed to be just a decoration because <laughs> we use it all for. the time. That's um, so, so then you have how many brothers and sisters? I had five older brothers. Five older brothers, <clears> and, and I was the baby. And these are these are not necessarily men um, who didn't do much. They they have a name for themselves. Yes, they do. So tell us a little bit about your okay. your most famous brothers. Well, <laughs> or brother, I always I always put Reed in that category too because yeah. he. Uh, well, there's Sloan. Sloan was Alexander Sloan was my first oldest brother. He was 18 when I was born. Hmm. Um, he became a screen and a TV writer. Hmm. He. Do you remember the movie uh, Springfield Rifle? I know the movie title. Sure. Uh, Sloan wrote the novel. No kidding. That they made into a movie. Wow. And that was Alexander Sloan Nibley? Or was yes. Sloan his last? No, uh, Alexander Sloan Nibley. Got yes, it. That was okay. my older brother. Got it. So that's probably where our performing side comes from. Um, and and I, well, I know I have that in me, and I know oh, that you. Oh, Grandpa Nibley loved acting. If he had been a businessman, he would be an actor. An in actor fact, businessman. What they had <laughs> up in Logan, they had. Uh, their little community theater and he loved to play in it and at one time he was the ghost in hamlet oh really and uh it was winter time and it was so cold backstage that he he had his you know ghosty garb on and he has these big boots on because hmm. his feet were so cold so when it was time for his cue to come on he forgot to take his boots off <laughs> and came clomping onto the stage of the ghost <laughs> That's, that's wonderful, and that's <laughs> but community theater. He was theater. very much of an actor. He yeah, and we still uh, have family in acting. I remember there was a movie called Rigoletto. Do you remember this DVD? Oh yes. Um, and we had there's a there's a one or two Nibleys in that are acting in well, that in that movie. Well, Hugh's uh, Hugh's grandson is very much in acting. That's probably who yeah. it was. Yeah. He, so you've got Alexander Sloan was your he, oldest. Okay, my oldest brother, and he he wrote a lot of movies. He was a freelance writer. Okay. Uh, and TV. In fact, in the, I have a, an album of things that I've saved about my brothers, and um, there's a, a list there of the things that. Things he's that he's done. Is that in our family history? <clears throat> uh, no, that's in a separate album. Okay. So you can photograph those if you want. Okay. Uh, then, then there's Hugh. Yeah. And of course, he was the preeminent scholar on ancient history and uh, languages. Yeah. So and that's Hugh Nibley, right? For those of you, because I know that just with my friends and family, they're yeah. going to know who Hugh, Nib who Hugh yeah. Nibley is. Mm -hmm. The older ones, <laughs> the younger ones usually don't. You know, I don't know. I bought a book at, and I bought his book a couple years ago at uh -huh. Ensign Books, and and the the young man checking me out knew exactly who he was. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. and from what I understand, Hugh remained incredibly relevant all through. Oh, you yeah. know, he understood pop culture and he understood, yeah. um, uh, you know, the younger generations. And, and uh, yes. how long did he, t he taught at BYU? Hmm. Oh, yes. For, well, let's see. I guess he was there from 40, just after the war. Just wow. after the war. Wow. 46. Hmm. He started the Y. And even after he retired, officially retired, then he, they stayed there and taught some classes. And I remember going to his house. I'd come to visit you in my maybe early 20s. And we, I, I remember two times we went over to his house uh -huh. and, and just sat yeah. and chatted. And I remember listening to him chat. I can't remember what, what we talked about, but I remember thinking, uh, this is a brilliant man. This, this is yeah. a man who knows things, right? He just a wealth of knowledge. Because we would sit down mm -hmm. and he would just talk and, and not so much would look at me and, and engage me so much. He was engaging his sister and I sat there. I remember just books and books and books. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was it was darker house. At the time I didn't recognize it. It was probably because of the heat in the summertime, uh, just like it's a little darker yeah. in here today. But um, uh, I, re I, I certainly remember yeah. um, uh, those interactions. Uh, so you had uh, Hugh, and then who was next? And then there was Richard. 
um, he became a very, very fine violinist. And he taught at, eventually, well, let's see, he got his master's. He was in the, I should go back and tell you that uh, Sloan was in the Navy. Okay. He wrote, tra during the war, he wrote training films mm. <clears throat> during the war for the Navy. And so he was stationed in Washington, D.C. Now, he, ha he was over in San Francisco at one time, and he was supposed to stop off in Fresno and pick up some film and then take it on back to Washington. So he called up the office of the colonel or whoever in Fresno and a voice answered and said, uh, or he said, this is uh, Lieutenant Nibley. And the fellow on the line says, this is Lieutenant Nibley. <laughs> he says, no, I'm Lieutenant Nibley. He says, well, I'm Lieutenant Nibley. Turned out to be his first cousin that he hadn't seen <laughs> since they were teenagers. How fun. <laughs> wow, what a yeah. coincidence. Yeah. And then Hugh was in the 101st Airborne Intelligence, and um, he was in some of the really high-level meetings all through the war with Eisenhower, Montgomery, you know. Mm. Monty. M Monty. <laughs> we don't mention that name. Oh, really? <laughs> really? You know, oh, yeah. the kids, because we were watching some war movies with the kids, yes. and we were sort of having this debate over who was a better general. Was it Monty or was it... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the Patton. Was, oh, Patton, yes. Yeah. Monty was just a, a typical Britisher that, you know. Kind of a windbag? He, <laughs> well, in Africa, he was evidently quite brilliant. But when he got to Europe, and he, he insisted on this one thing that happened in Holland. Um, in fact, Jeff could tell you more about that. But... Uh, it was the worst defeat of the war. Oh! It was the worst defeat, and, and Monty did that all. And I believe but that they... Didn't, but they thought he was grand. You know? Oh, so yeah. Anyway, and... Hugh was in that, and, and uh, he was uh, on the first wave on Utah Beach. Was in it? Was in it. <sighs> driving a Jeep on the beach. Wow. <clears throat> from the landing craft. So, uh, and then, then after he got home, he um, went to the Y, got married. And now, was there a logging business, a foresting oh, business? Oh, this is way back with Grandpa. That was way back? Yeah, with Grandpa. And did, did Hugh sell that business? No, oh, you didn't have anything to do with it. Okay, that. I remember hearing that. In, I think it was a documentary, actually, a church-produced thing. Mm. I don't remember, though. I just no. have vague shadows from my childhood. Oh, that goes back quite a ways. Okay. My, my dad, Grandpa, and my dad were into that. So, anyway. Okay. <clears throat> so, we're back to Richard. Richard. Uh, yeah, he was in uh, tank corps that went across France. Wow. He was also uh, not only a fine violinist, but he did some composing. Hmm. And I have a newspaper article that shows in, oh, I can't remember the name of the town in Germany, where the symphony orchestra played one of his pieces. Hmm. And he was also a very fine painter. Wow. He was an artist, very good. And then uh, he ended up coming back to Utah. Um, he played with the Utah Symphony, and then he went down to Ephraim, and he was teaching music at uh, Snow College. Hmm. And started, well, they, he, both he and his wife, in fact, his wife, took lessons from him <laughs> when he came back cute. to but, uh, And she went on a mission to Switzerland, and then they got married when he came back, and they ended up in Ephraim at Snow College, and they started um, teaching violin, and uh, he organized many st string groups, little string symphonies and so forth, hmm. in that area, in the area. Fun. Yeah. <clears throat> it was nice. So, uh, unfortunately, he passed away. He was only 66. Mm. He had all, um, uh, Lou Gehrig disease. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. 66. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, something we'll have to look at in our in our DNA. We yeah. had just done yeah. a DNA study, uh -huh. uh, and and we're just it was interesting to see what what we already knew and and learning some mm -hmm. some new things. Will you get into my backpack and just have an extra card ready in case this one runs out? Mm -hmm. So that so, so then then that's Richard, and then the next boy uh, was Philip. Uh, 
he was um, had illnesses, and they say it was heart disease, and he died when he was only 15. Oh, wow. Were you, and how old were you I at that time? I was six, I think. Okay. Do you remember so, that experience? I remember, yes. I remember because in those old days, they would bring the body home and put it out in the living room so everybody could come and visit. It's like the viewing. Wow. Yes, wow. the viewing right there in your house. And I remember our, because we had a very, very large living room, a big house and a large living room. And uh, it was all dark and I remember the people coming and it was so sad. Yeah, I <laughs> can know. imagine. Were you close with him uh, no. growing up? I mean, there's a lot of big no, age group, there was an age, age, yeah. age gap there. And then, then, then it was Reed. Yeah. And, uh... Very tall. You, Reed's very tall. No. No. No, he's a little guy. You know, it must be my childhood memories. Yes. Remember, because I remember him being very tall, oh, but it's no. been years. Uh -uh. He's very small. Okay, very I thought small. maybe that's where Brian got his height from. We don't know where he got <laughs> So we're shorties. We're short Irishmen on this side of the family. <laughs> yes. And Reed's also a musician. Oh, extraordinary. Wow. Extraordinary. Yeah. You didn't get a, you weren't here to my birthday party, were you? No, I wasn't. Thank you for yeah. reminding me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll have to check and see if Mark still has a DVD because the BYU did a documentary on Reed's life. Oh, wow. And it is outstanding. That's great. It is just beautiful. Well, we'll have to look for that. Maybe that's on the internet somewhere, too. I don't know. On a was, BYU thing, something. Well, no, because it was done by a private company. Oh, okay. That, uh, it was a family foundation, and they uh, gave funds to do certain cultural things. Fun. And so um, they had a um, program at the BYU where people came to honor Reed, came from all over the country. Yeah. Uh, they were going to have it in the spring, and then they found out that his cancer was quite aggressive. <coughs> Excuse me, and so they had it, I think it was November or something like that. What type of cancer did he have? Colon. Colon cancer. Yeah. And so it spread, so. He wrote some songs that were uh, that are in the hymnal. Well, he's, he wrote the children's song, uh, I Know My Father Lives. Yes. So he wrote that, and then he wrote songs. He made some beautiful arrangements of hymns. Mm lovely arrangements of hymns that are done with violin and piano or flute and piano and so forth. And and they're on this CD. Oh, I'll great. Read, um, I'd love for you to ask Mark about that next time you talk to him. I'll ask Holly too, maybe she's got a uh, Yeah, maybe you could, yeah, she should have one. Yeah, if she does, she, yeah, it'd be great to yeah, get a copy yeah. of that. So then after yeah. Reed came... Me. Came you. And we were about three years apart. We well, close? Reed and Philip were very, very close. Mm. And they were buddies. They love to scare me. They love to put me in the elevator and... You poor thing with an elevator in your home in the 1930s. Well, they did that. <laughs> this was a big home and because Philip had the heart trouble. Oh, okay, they put, yeah. They put the elevator So he was born with, with heart, heart troubles. I don't know, you know, that far back. Yeah, tough Who to knows? remember. Who knows? Yeah. So, um, but they were buddies and they would like to trap me in the elevator and then stop it between floors. <laughs> Sounds like me and Dustin with Brittany. We, yes. we kind of did similar things. We trapped her in the laundry room and make ghost sounds. Oh. You know, in, our, in the laundry room in our house in Long Beach, if you remember that little house we lived in, uh, there was no windows in there. So when you no. shut the kitchen door and the yeah. other door, it was dark in there. And we would, ooh. And you know what, what reminded, it was the Canterville Ghost, which is a oh, DVD yeah. we just kind of stole from you. Um, uh, it was, because we'd watched that, we told her that our house was haunted and that, that kind yeah. of ties it on, which is why I told you I wanted to grab the Canterville mm -hmm. Ghost, because we have uh -huh. a lot of, Alyssa Milano was in that. We have yeah. a lot of memories with that. They um, did another one too. I'm not sure if, uh, the yeah, I guess that was the one because they had an earlier one too. Like from, or, or like a black yeah. and white With type John of. John Gilgood. Oh, okay. All right. Yes, yeah, so a little bit earlier. Yes. Okay, fantastic. But anyway. So what? Tell us about so, your childhood and what you loved to do and some of your passions. I was just sort of by myself, but Reed and I got quite close. We'd play things together. Um, we uh, Reed. Well, we both started, everybody in the family had to take music lessons. Yeah. I mean, that was a given. <laughs> there was no if, and, or but. You had a piano teacher or a music oh, yes. teacher? Okay. Oh, piano teacher. Uh, and, well, mother had decided what each of us was going to be. When I was just a few days old, <laughs> people would come to visit. She's going to be an opera singer. 
you know, and Reed was going to be a pianist, concert pianist. Yeah. And, you know, Richard was a violinist and so forth. So anyway, um, Reed, Reed loved to practice. He, well, at first he didn't. He hated to practice. And he said what, at one time that he, when he grew up, he would like to take an axe or a hatchet and destroy every piano that's on the earth. So it was a pretty strict uh, <laughs> practice regime. Yeah, but he got to love it. And so he, um, he loved to practice, but he hated to perform mm -hmm. before people. Mm -hmm. That's James. And so, mm -hmm. um, but he, he became a concert pianist, but he decided that rather than um, be a concert pianist and travel the world, he would prefer to teach mm -hmm. because he wanted to get married, have a family, mm -hmm. and have roots. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he went through, he went to USC and he went to uh, U, U of U and he went to University of Mission, mm -hmm. Michigan, and then came back to the Y to teach and was there for the rest of his career. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was the um, pianist for the Utah State Symphony. Mm. In fact, um, uh, at this one time, the, con the conductor of the symphony, Maurice Bravanel, would have Reed come and play. See, see, he would play, rehearse with the orchestra when a professional musician was going to come mm -hmm. and perform. So he would practice with it. So he had quite a list of uh, concertos that he could play. So this one time he got a phone call from Maurice Bravanel and he asked him, he said, uh, Eugene List was supposed to come and record this certain piece with the Utah Symphony, but he had, he had a conflict and he couldn't come. So he said, would you learn it and, and record it with us? Oh wow. Two weeks. <laughs> and Reed had never even heard the piece before. He never heard of it. So in two weeks, he learned this piece. Wow. And it is just fabulous. He said it was the most athletic piece he'd ever played. <laughs> athletic. What an interesting, yeah. interesting word. Yeah. Um, so anyway, he did record it. But uh, very, very fine pianist, wonderful teacher. Everybody just loved him. He was just a sweet wonderful person. It's very neat to see how lovingly you uh, you talk about him and uh, uh, Oh, he was I wish sometimes I wish that we'd lived in Utah or closer mm -hmm. to the family because we were down there in Southern California and didn't get together too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's hard because you had a you had a lot of kids too. You had uh, six kids. Yes. Um, Hugh had eight. Oh, wow. Reed Some big had families. Six. And that explains my love for big families. Mm -hmm. uh, we always had a bunch of cousins around, and we'll, I want to get to that in a second, but I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the things I remember about you, because you're not uh, a non-performer either. In fact, one of my fondest memory of you is family camp. And we only went to family camp one year. Uh, and this is a, a camp that, that sort of all the brothers, uh, uncles had gone to multiple times and even Uncle Kevin was just there uh, just, just a week ago or just this week. Um, but we did a talent show night. <laughs> and my grandmother, I was so proud, I was beaming. Um, <laughs> because I've been a performer since a young kid. I was eight years old, I was in this performance of uh, Long Beach City College of, of A Christmas Carol. And I played Tiny Tim. I've got that in my family history. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh, um, yes. And that, that's yeah. when the bug bit me, and, and I've, uh, I've been performing ever since. Um, <laughs> but my grandma gets on stage, and she does this monologue about the ballet. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but I can't go to the ballet. Uh, this is in a Yiddish dialect. A Yiddish dialect. She's doing this accent. Her hands are moving and engaging the audience. And I remember watching you with this, <laughs> just this adoration in my eyes <laughs> and thinking, I can do it too. I don't know that I've ever shared that with you. No, you haven't. That's news to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're about to go out of it. So, so um, you had done this monologue at family camp and it absolutely blew my mind. What was, what was that all about? Because I, I don't remember. I just remember it was yeah, just... Yeah, this is that. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, one of my great grandfathers was the first Jew to join the Mormon Church. And who was this? That was Alexander Niver. 
Alexander Nyberg. Nyberg. I remember that name. Yes. And it's probably he, for he these reasons. He was born in the uh, in Breitstein Fort Aaron Breitstein uh, fortress along the Rhine River, just across from Koblenz. And I was able to take a picture of it. Is that Prussia, Germany? No, it was it was that part. It was that part along the Rhine where one year it was France. Then they had a war, and then it was Germany's. Mm. And then they had another war, and then it became France. Okay. <laughs> and then, you know, one of those. And Niber became Nibley. No. No, no okay. It was always Niber, because okay. there's lots of Nibers. Okay. They had a big family. But, uh, but Nibley's a family name. That's my father's name. Right, okay. My grandfather married Alexander's daughter. Cool. Yeah. Got it. So, and that was Rebecca. But anyway, um, of course, Living in Southern California, having Jewish parentage, a lot of Jewish people around, and we had a, we had a beautiful old Victrola. Yes. Do you remember the Victrola? Yes. Okay. One of our favorite records was called Cohen on the Telephone, hmm. and it was this comedy sketch with the Yiddish dialect, and we just loved that. We played that over and over and picked up the dialect. And so when Reed and I would talk together, we would you know, use the Yiddish, and and it was just fun. Yeah. <clears throat> when we were in New York together, when we were both singles, uh, we were in New York together, we had to be very careful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be taken the wrong way. Yeah, but um, anyway, I don't know how, but we got a hold of this book. The family had this book. I guess somebody gave it to them. Um, and it was it was all it's called Nice Baby, Nice Baby, and it was all uh, Jewish uh, families and in apartment houses and so forth, yelling back and forth to each other, mm -hmm. and everything. And we learned things from that. And then somehow, I think it was Reed got a hold of this ballot, and then I picked it up and I used it for years. In fact, I did um, this. Uh, after the war, and, and I was at the BYU, they asked me and my friend, who is a good actor, mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to do the uh, junior prom um, program. And so, on the stage, what I did was, I did the ballet in a costume that was just an old baggy stuff. And then I scooted off stage, took that off, and then I had a tutu and toe slippers, <laughs> and he had leotards, and we did it to the dance of the hours. Oh my goodness! We did a gracious. dance to that, mm -hmm. and you know, fifty years later, I saw this faculty wife, and she says, "I still remember that." <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! That's fantastic. But anyway, um, yeah, the kids always wanted to hear that. And that's what happened. It was Jeff. Jeff was hosting it. Uh, uh, was hosting that event. Oh yeah, uh, he and he and Mandy. And Mandy did it. Yes. yes, and he called you up. I don't know if you had planned to do it or not, but he called you up, and <laughs> and you and you just shined. And you have been um, uh, sort of the. <laughs> you have introduced me to the great loves of my life, right? Um, the arts and oh, um, uh, singing and 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 it's it's that we used to come over and we would watch the sound of music mm -hmm. um, and the kids would just burst into song yeah because <laughs> you knew every one of them we do and and uh, <laughs> you know I remember and and even the Wizard of Oz and 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 having this appreciation for culture um, which has sort of been lost I think over the last couple of generations yes. right yeah. and 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 culture has been degraded. Uh, into nonsense and, and loud noises um, and just but recently see, that's the way I was raised because my parents were very much into the arts mm -hmm. my mother my mother met my father when she was over studying music in Berlin hmm. and my dad was mission president in Holland Netherlands and they were at a conference in Berlin and that's how he met my mother amazing and and we always had we had soirees at night from the time I was Way well. In fact, when when I was a baby, when Reed was a baby, mother would take us in a clothes basket with her darning and mending, and we would go to the morning rehearsals mm. of the Philharmonic at the Hollywood Bowl. Oh wow! And I grew up at the Hollywood Bowl, 
And then even when we got to be teenagers, we would go about three o'clock in the afternoon, take a, uh, a lunch, get the cheap seats, yeah. and, and then Reed and I would run all over the hills, have a great time while the, while the early birds were gabbing. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and, uh, but we heard the greatest artists and, uh, and, and, and my, my parents just knew a lot of the arty people. <laughs> we would have these soirees in our home all the time because we had a big living room. This was, you know, before the depression. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and you know so, now, and and, and uh, there was this resurgence but right before I got married, um, resurgence in my life of of reconnecting with the classics, mm -hmm. uh, Sound of Music being one of them, and and I bought the DVD. Well, I've not for me, that isn't a classic. Of course, no, a classic for me, yeah, <laughs> yes. because that's going to be a newer piece, I would yeah, think, more yeah. more modern. Um, but I shared it with my kids, gorgeous. and my kids, I shared it with begrudgingly, right? They just didn't weren't interested in it. Um, and it was the same with The Wizard of Oz, but it opens up in black and white. And then when it gets to the color, all the kids stopped whining. Mm -hmm. And they just were in awe over it. And we've only seen it a couple times because I lost the DVD. But The Sound of Music, um, they watched begrudgingly. And now when we take a family road trip, it's the first movie that they want to watch. Mm -hmm. Even Kanan enjoys it. And he sort of resists the arts because he's more of an athlete. Um, loves that the Nazis are involved. Oh, and that yes. there's the World War II aspect <laughs> to it, but the kids now they walk around the house singing singing these songs and and uh, uh, from Scotty to all of them, yeah. um, and so that's that's sort of uh, something that I, I always I always remember. Um, we're running out of disc tapes here, so I want to ask you a little bit about um, the house in Long Beach, uh, which is where my first memories mm -hmm. of of you are, uh, because the house in Long Beach was like I in Hawaiian Gardens. And I remember coming up there, hot days, Sundays, family dinners, Christmases, Easter's, it was mm -hmm. all at the house. And, and that yeah. door kind of cracked a little bit, like, right when you opened it. And I'll, I'll never forget the sound because it <laughs> meant we were at grandma's house. Uh -huh. um, and well, then in you... fact, in, uh, as I've been retyping our family history, um, there was a part where it said, uh, when Dustin was just a little guy, he said whenever they'd turn the corner coming into our cul-de-sac, he would start jumping up and down on the seat. Oh yeah, that makes <laughs> I, I absolutely remember. And I remember even leaving the house. We'd leave at nine, ten o'clock at night, and Grandpa would come out and put his hands on the car, and he'd he'd pretend like he was pushing, uh, <laughs> pushing the car and and sending us away. I remember you adding the bricks. I remember adding the family room. Um, how long did you live there, and and you know how did you guys come to to that that place? Well, uh, Lynn worked for J.C. Penney Company mm. for thirty three years, and we had moved quite a lot. We were down in San Marcos. We were only there for a year and two months living, but Grandpa worked there for five years. Wow! So he was commuting from Tustin. Wow, from Tustin to San Marcos. Yeah. That's a drive. For four years. Yeah. Then we moved down. Well, at that time, the area wasn't as grown up like it is now. Right. And so, um, and besides the, the Marine Base, PX was there, so the families were buying stuff at the PX. Yeah. You know, and Penny, Penny's didn't get, at, uh, he opened that store in Carlsbad. He was responsible wow. for opening that store in Carlsbad and it had everything it was at that time it was the largest store in the company wow and do you remember uh, where it was located yeah just off the freeway um, in that May company the road that you go to Vista okay sure yeah that road that you go to yeah. Vista yeah I mean we live right by there now yeah. you know in fact I have friends who live in Vista commuting yeah. to Irvine for work, so it's almost the same drive. <laughs> yeah. Was it still the 78 to the five, or was it like the five to a road? No, it was right on to that. Okay. It was right on to that. Okay. So anyway, um, he talked to his bosses and said, I have to make more money. He yeah. says, I need Good man. a higher producing store because I've got two boys on missions, I've got two in college, and two coming up. And so I need to make some more money. <laughs> <laughs> and so they gave him a choice of three different stores in the Los Angeles. Well, in fact, they, they offered him Santa Barbara. Oh, wow. And for some reason or other, he didn't take that, but he took Huntington, Huntington Park. Hmm. 
because it was a high producing store. And so um, you didn't want to live that close to it. But we had been to family camp with our friends from Long Beach for several years. Mm -hmm. And so when I told Lynette and Brian that we had to move, they looked at each other and said, we're going to Long Beach. <laughs> and so we found this place in Long Beach and we were there for almost 24 years. 24 years. And that's amazing because every other place it had been two to three years. We were nine years in Tustin, but other than that we moved. In fact, um, Laura uh, has been looking up a lot of family history mm -hmm. and recently she asked me for all the addresses that I had lived Oh, that's at. fun. <laughs> and so I started listing them all. I could only remember, or I had listed, those that we lived in California or after we were married, I should say, in 1949. Mm -hmm. So, but before that, um, I found that since I was born, I had lived in 26 different places. Wow, 26 <laughs> different places. Yes, but we were almost 24 in Long Beach, and I, that was a very, very happy time of our lives because we had all these grandchildren. Yeah. We would have, 11, 12 adults and 15 to 20 grandchildren. Yeah. And it was just, you know, it's only a small house, but. Uh, that you remember. To me, it yeah. was a kingdom. Uh, <laughs> there was a smell. There was the living room no one was allowed in. There was the stage. Right when you walk yeah. in, there's this like marble type. It wasn't it was marble, a but it's slate. Yeah, yeah. And it was covered as shiny and, and, yes. and then a step down and then you're in the nice living room. Well, we, we use that every Christmas. We use that stage to tell stories, and there was always a Christmas program oh, yes. uh, at the house. And, yeah. and, uh, Feliz Navidad. Yes, you remember. <laughs> the well, family singing Feliz Navidad. We did that, and we had little uh, candy shakers. You know, mm -hmm. you put the sprinkles on the cookies. We had those, and we used those like maracas. Uh, when when yeah. we when we sang those and and uh, <laughs> and then we had the bat we had the office and and uh, the refrigerator in the garage and grandma had a refrigerator in the garage and it was kind of like let's see what's out there and yeah. uh, grandpa's candy you know we had the sugar free candy because of course uh, grandpa had diabetes and um, we would sneak that and of course he would sneak us regular candy and mm -hmm. uh, just the joy they came Every, coming to your house was coming into joy mm -hmm. it was it was it was taking a time out from whatever had happened that day and maybe nothing maybe something mm -hmm. um, and and now we were at grandma's house where we got to see our cousins who are our best friends uh, growing up and that's the same type of childhood we've sought to to raise our kids with and and with Teresa's family being so close our kids their best friends are are our nieces and nephews yes. their cousins um, as we sort of wind down here, I want to put you on the spot. Um, you, you said, you mentioned earlier I was like pig pen, and it's not surprising at all. Um, oh, I, I have to tell you too, that in one place in, in my family history, I've got where I was babysitting you and Holly. Yeah. And I called you, I called her Miss Destructo, <laughs> and Owen, Mr. Destructo. <laughs> and then when Brittany would come, it was just like a whirlwind, and the place would be in a mess. I bet. Oh. I bet. And you know, I'm paying for that now. <laughs> I'm paying the recompense for that now with uh, with these kids, yes. because you know James will just take off his shirt and just leave it wherever he is. May it be the, uh -huh. the, the beach or, or the living room. It's just going to lie where it is, and we're sort of trying to break all those habits right now. Um, can you share um, a, a funny, a bad, and embarrassing moment about me from from those days, from the childhood days? And maybe it's even the high school days, because we were there up until I think my 18th yeah. year was when we stopped having Christmases yeah. there. Not particularly embarrassing. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, nothing specific. It was just a. It was just a riot all the time. Yeah. It was just a riot. But I. One thing that I did want to say, for for Owen's posterity, is he was a hard worker. Hmm. When he came and did yard work for us, he worked hard, and we really appreciated that. I remember that. He was good at working. Yeah, and I still. He I, could be a pain in the neck, but he is a good <laughs> worker. <laughs> let's cut that part out. Let's let's edit that part out. Well, thank you, Grandma, for spending this time and, oh, and doing this. It's been a, this a nice walk down memory lane. Has it? Good. Well, I'm excited to re-engage with the family history too, because it's sort of kind of hanging out in the in the in the wall unit, and we it's it, stuff just gets piled on top, and yeah. you know it'll be fun well, to kind of get it out. And get uh, it again. I will get you a, a new improved 
Copy. 2.0, Family History 2.0. I can't wait. Thanks guys. <laughs>